Hey everyone, today we'll be discussing aortic stenosis and some of the implications your patient having aortic stenosis could have on your anesthetic management. As you guys know, the aortic valve is located between the left ventricle and the ascending aorta. The valve opens during systole to allow the left ventricle to pump oxygenated blood into coronary and systemic circulation. It's important to know that in a normal aortic valve, the orifice measures around 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters squared. If your patient has aortic stenosis, knowing how much the valvular orifice is reduced can help you to get a better idea of how severe your patient's disease process is. A good place to find this information is in your patient's most recent echo. Another important thing to remember when looking at your patient's echo is that if their aortic orifice measures less than 0.8 centimeters squared, then they're considered to have severe or critical stenosis. So what changes when your patient's aortic valve is stenotic? Well, severity varies from patient to patient and progression is normally slow. But let's say that this is the valve and that this is the left ventricle. As the aortic orifice gets smaller and smaller, our afterload increases more and more and we have increased resistance to ventricular ejection of blood. Since the heart has to generate more force to eject its stroke volume, it suffers from pressure overload and increased wall tension. This changes how the left ventricle's normal pressure volume loop looks. As you can see here, the pressure required during isovolumetric contraction to open the aortic valve rises, but our stroke volume decreases. The left ventricle compensates for the decreased stroke volume that's caused by the increased afterload with concentric hypertrophy, so we get a thickened ventricle wall with decreased compliance and smaller chamber size. Unfortunately, this progressive compensation increases myocardial oxygen needs because of the bigger size while decreasing oxygen supply because of subendocardial compression. This, of course, can lead to myocardial ischemia and left ventricular failure. Once the patient becomes symptomatic with their aortic stenosis, their prognosis is extremely poor without valve replacement. When managing the anesthesia of your patient with aortic stenosis, there are two equations to remember that can help you to make treatment decisions that will prevent them from rapidly decompensating. First, remember how to calculate cardiac output, which is stroke volume times heart rate. If your patient's aortic valve is non-compliant and their left ventricle is hypertrophied, the heart cannot easily make changes in stroke volume in response to an increased or decreased cardiac output. And severe aortic stenosis is actually considered a fixed stroke volume disease. And this makes cardiac output completely dependent on heart rate. This means that maintaining a normal sinus rhythm and a normal atrial kick are critical. Depending on which text you read, our goal heart rate is between 60 and 80 beats per minute, and any arrhythmia should be treated immediately. Tachycardia is specifically poorly tolerated because it does not allow enough time in diastole to perfuse the coronary arteries. Second, remember the equation for coronary perfusion pressure, which is equal to aortic diastolic pressure minus left ventricular and diastolic pressure. As I said earlier, patients with aortic stenosis have an increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure. This means that if we allow the patient to become hypotensive, which would equate to a decreased aortic diastolic pressure, even for a short amount of time, we risk severely impeding the perfusion of our coronary arteries. Patients with aortic stenosis, especially those with severe disease progression, are at risk for rapid decompensation when under anesthesia, and we can make it worse if we don't prepare and respond appropriately. With that in mind, here are some recommendations to help keep your aortic stenosis patients safe while they're under anesthesia. First, consider using an arterial line to monitor your blood pressure. With severe stenosis, using an A-line is especially important because these patients don't tolerate even short episodes of hypotension. Remember what we talked about, how coronary perfusion pressure is equal to aortic diastolic pressure minus left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So maintaining blood pressure is really important for coronary perfusion. If the disease is severe enough, it wouldn't be a bad idea to put in your A-line even prior to the induction of anesthesia. Second, make sure you're maintaining your patient in normal sinus rhythm. Especially make sure you're doing things to avoid tachycardia. With that in mind, make sure you're doing something to avoid excess stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system with intubation and make sure you're treating your patient's pain appropriately. It's also smart to keep a close eye out for any changes in your patient's ST segment since these patients are at risk for myocardial ischemia. Third, make sure you're avoiding hypotension. It's a good idea to always have a presser mixed and ready to administer. Phenylephrine or neosinephrine is usually the go-to drug of choice because it increases blood pressure without increasing the patient's heart rate. Other pressors like vasopressin could be fine too, but make sure you're not reaching for something like ephedrine that could increase your patient's heart rate. You may also have to rethink your go-to induction sequence drugs since the high doses of propofol most of us rely on can cause severe hypotension that would be detrimental to this patient. 
All right, guys, that about covers it for your basic pathophysiology and anesthetic management for patients with aortic stenosis. I hope that helps you guys out in the operating room. Uh, thanks very much for watching, and if you are interested in knowing more or just curious where I got my information, I have cited the resources below. Thank you.